For most of the Xbox 360's two-decade lifespan, its software security system has held firm, even in the face of various successful soft mods for its peers, the Wii and PlayStation 3. After the embarrassment that was the original Xbox's security, Microsoft knew they had to step up for its successor, and for the most part, they pulled no punches. Despite a few missteps early on, Microsoft was ultimately successful in plugging most of the gaps, and to this day, attaining full control of the system to run Homebrew, which thrived on the original Xbox, has remained elusive without direct modification of the hardware. That is, until late 2024, when all of a sudden a new 360 exploit called Bad Update was announced by security engineer Grim Doomer. And while it's no replacement for an honest-to-god hard mod, it does crack the door open ever so slightly to 360 modding for those with no ability or will to solder, proving that no matter how secure something may be, there's always room for improvement. How did this happen? How does the 360 security work and what did he do to defeat it? Today we'll be covering all that and more after a message from our sponsor. If you're in need of a website and don't want to mess around with writing code or having to set up and maintain a server, then Squarespace is one of the easiest ways to do it. They have over a hundred templates to choose from, whether you need a website for an online store, portfolio, business, or blog, Squarespace has you covered and will get you up and running in no time. And if you need to make any customizations, their site editor is a breeze to you, so you can really give your website the personal touch it needs. I used Squarespace for my online store and loved just how easy it was to get a great looking result. It integrated immediately with everything that I needed it to, and it gave me peace of mind to know that my store was in good hands. So if you want a great looking website with no fuss, head over to squarespace.com slash mattkcbytes to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. But now back to the Xbox 360. The Xbox 360 pioneered what is now a tried and true paradigm for console security. All user software runs on top of a hypervisor, kind of like a lightweight virtual machine. The hypervisor is the almighty gatekeeper, making sure that no code runs without explicit approval from Microsoft. No, really, every piece of code must be digitally signed with their private key. And since the signature incorporates a hash of the data, the hypervisor will know if an executable has been tampered with even slightly. Nothing runs that Microsoft hasn't had a chance of vetting first. But unlike a conventional virtual machine, games do still have direct access to almost all of the hardware on the system and can, for the most part, do whatever they want. They can even overwrite the flash and brick the system if they want to. But they can't load additional code or write to executable memory. Only the hypervisor can do that, and it stops Homebrew dead in its tracks. Naturally, the hypervisor was very protected. Games can call into it for certain low-level tasks, but it's very diligent about validating all of the data it receives so that nothing can be used to compromise it. Games having direct hardware access was undoubtedly good for performance, but was also, funnily enough, another layer of security. Keeping the hypervisor away from hardware meant less opportunities to exploit it. You know how at one point the PS3 could be exploited merely by inserting a USB jailbreak device? That couldn't happen with the 360. Whatever damage could be done would only affect the game, not the hypervisor. There's obviously a lot more to it than that, but all in all, the hypervisor was a masterclass of console security. Grim Doomer calls the hypervisor one of the most secure pieces of code Microsoft has ever written, and the proof is in the pudding. But even so, no software is truly perfect, and the hypervisor has been subject to one bug discovery early in the 360's lifespan in 2006. The King Kong exploit, or more accurately the 4548 system call handler bug, was a bug that was actually introduced to the Xbox 360's hypervisor via an update in October 2006. Bear with me here because it's impossible to explain this without looking at the PowerPC assembly code, which is probably why it was able to sneak under Microsoft's radar in the first place. As I mentioned, games can accomplish a handful of low-level tasks by calling into the hypervisor. As I also mentioned, the hypervisor does a lot of checks on any incoming request. Here you can see it ensures the requested call number is between 0 and hex 60 because that's how many calls there are. It then uses a lookup table to know what code to jump to based on the requested call. Despite being a 64-bit CPU, the designers knew there was only ever going to be 512 megabytes of memory, so the memory addresses on the 360 are only 30 bits long, with the remaining bits reserved for kind of metadata about the address. The table contains just raw addresses pointing to the code for each system call. Each one is stored in 32-bit, or 4-byte, entries, so to find the right one, all the hypervisor has to do is multiply the call number by 4. Except it actually just shifts the number two bits to the left, because that happens to be the fastest way to multiply a number by four in binary. They're using the 32-bit version of this bit shifting instruction, which also has the side effect of clearing out the upper 32 bits of the value. The lookup table is also protected using both encryption and a CRC checksum to ensure that no one has tampered with it and pointed an entry to custom code. Except there is a flag in that address metadata I mentioned that basically tells the hypervisor to not worry about encryption or checksumming. It's called, and again, bear with me here, the HRMOR bypass bit. 
The HRMOR, or Hypervisor Real Mode Offset Register, is a register set during early initialization that forces all addresses to use the encrypted and checksummed pathway, unless the bypass bit is set, which means it can set its own pathway. Ordinarily, there's no way to set this bit since it's in the upper 32 bits of the address which get cleared out. That is, until kernel version 4532, where the instruction was inexplicably replaced with the 64-bit version of the instruction that does not clear out the upper 32 bits. Meanwhile, all the other instructions that checked that the system call was valid still only checked the lower 32 bits as they did before. Effectively, this makes it possible to sneak data into the uppermost 30 bits of an address, including the HRMOR bypass bit. And what that means is, if we overwrite an address in the system call table with one that's unencrypted and would normally break the CRC integrity check, the hypervisor will use it anyway. We can still only point to somewhere in the hypervisor segment, but that doesn't matter because if we find a versatile instruction like jump to whatever address is in register R4, then we just have to point register R4 to some code we want to run in hypervisor mode, and suddenly we have full control of the system. Most famously, this was triggered via a game exploit discovered in the 2005 King Kong movie tie-in game's shader loading code. Really, any game exploit could have been used, and many exploitable games have been discovered since. This just happened to be the best one people had at the time. Modifying the shader required using a secondary 360 exploit where early models had DVD drive firmware that could be flashed to spoof the media type of a burned DVD to an official disk. This could be used to enable piracy or light tampering of files that didn't need to be signed, but the main code still had to be signed by Microsoft. Defeating the hypervisor on top of that required a lot more work. Of course, Microsoft patched the hypervisor bug shortly after it was discovered, and since it was so early in the 360's lifespan, it's extremely rare to find a unit that hasn't been updated well past this version. Of course, Microsoft also made it impossible to downgrade the 360 too. You may be wondering how Microsoft let such a simple mistake slip through when they were otherwise so careful about the 360's security. Grim Duma suspects it might have actually been a bug in Microsoft's PowerPC compiler. Apparently, if you diff the various versions of the 360 OS, you can see several instances of instructions getting swapped out with equivalent or similar ones for no apparent reason. Microsoft presumably continued to tweak the code generated by the compiler throughout the 360's lifespan, and that could explain why these instructions inexplicably changed. Indeed, it does seem unlikely that someone would replace this instruction intentionally, or even accidentally, unless there was no reason to check whether any of that code had changed. But in all honesty, barring some release of insider information, we'll likely never know exactly why this bug occurred. So that exploit was discovered in 2006, and that was the last time anyone had managed to find a bug in the hypervisor. Until 18 years later, when someone finally found another. It all started when Grim Duma discovered an exploit in Tony Hawk's American Wasteland that could be used for arbitrary code execution. On its own, this didn't really change much about the 360s scene. It was a lot easier to trigger than the King Kong exploit, only needing a modified save file from a USB stick rather than having to modify shaders on the disk. But once again, the hypervisor prevented any further compromising of the system. Without another hypervisor bug, the Tony Hawk hack didn't really accomplish much on the 360. But Grim Duma was persistent. A hypervisor bug had long been a hacking bucket list item for him. He had looked at the 360 code some 15 years earlier to no avail, but after several years of experience as a professional security engineer, he figured if there was any time to try doing it, this seemed to be the time. His approach was simple. No fuzzer, no emulation environment, just load up the compiled code in IDA and look at it. Initially, he searched for low-hanging fruit, like out-of-bounds memory accesses, overflows or underflows, race conditions, lack of parameter validation, things that can be exploited without much complexity. Predictably, he didn't find anything, and he would have been disappointed if he had, so it was time to dig a little deeper into what the calls actually did. One of them looked extremely interesting. HVX keys execute, a hypervisor function that takes a small piece of executable code, signed by Microsoft of course, and runs it in hypervisor mode. Its main use is for simple one-time operations, like performing additional security checks during software updates. These payloads were really interesting from an exploit standpoint, because even though the code still had to be signed, it was specifically to do non-standard ad hoc operations in hypervisor mode, which increases the likelihood of one of them introducing a system compromising bug. He downloaded a bunch of system updates and analyzed them, eventually finding around 25 executable payloads. These two had no apparent trivial bugs in them, but one of them stood out as having pretty unusual behavior that could possibly be exploited. But the exploit required modifying encrypted memory, which no one had ever successfully done before. I mentioned protected memory earlier, that's memory that's encrypted and CRC checksummed for integrity. But there's also just memory that's encrypted without the CRC check. Encrypted memory can be changed without the hypervisor knowing, but of course it has to be encrypted in exactly the same way or else the 360 will try to decrypt it and produce garbage data in the process. This is a lot easier said than done because the 360's memory encryption keys are different per boot, per address, and per page allocation. 
That means we can't just grab a different piece of encrypted memory and write it over the part we want to attack because the encryption is different all over the system. Only the hypervisor knows exactly how to encrypt any given part of memory, making it extremely difficult to attack from a game. Even so, Microsoft was still aware that it could theoretically be tampered with, and as such, the hypervisor never implicitly trusts encrypted memory, typically only writing to it to share data to kernel mode, never reading back and operating on it. Except for that one update payload from earlier that seemed to do exactly that. It ran a decompression function in hypervisor mode and used a list of data and function pointers that were all encrypted, but not protected. If one of those pointers could be replaced, it could end up severely compromising hypervisor mode. But how could you possibly put custom data into encrypted memory? Well, strap in because this is about to get complicated. It is actually possible to just encrypt memory on the 360. There are official hypervisor APIs that can be used to do so. They even let us choose a location so we can encrypt it exactly the right address for the memory we're trying to replace. Hey, that's nice of them. In fact, it's not entirely clear why Microsoft provided these APIs. In some ways, they almost defeat the purpose of encrypting the memory at all. Presumably, they thought game developers might want it for something, but it's hard to imagine what kind of game data would need that much protection. But for our purposes, we can be very glad they did. But of course, we can't allocate over memory that's already there, and this is where it gets complicated. Remember, another key is also randomly generated every time a page is allocated, so even encrypting on the same boot at the same location still won't get us exactly the same encryption. Grim Doomer called this page allocation key the whitening value. Sadly, there's no way to influence or retrieve the whitening value being used for any given page. As far as the hypervisor is concerned, it's none of our business. But there is still hope. Turns out this whitening value is only 10 bits long, for a maximum range of 0 to 1023. So while the probability is low, it is possible to get memory with the same one if you just reallocate the page over and over and over. But how do you know you got the right whitening value when there's no way to see what it is? Well, this is what Grim Doomer did. He would get a small excerpt from the data he was trying to replace. It didn't matter where it was as long as it was in the same memory page so it had the same whitening value. He called this excerpt Oracle Data. Then he would use the hypervisor APIs to encrypt both the Oracle data and the data he wanted to graft at their respective locations, again within the same page allocation so they both had the same whitening value. Then he would run a loop, constantly loading and unloading the original data. Each time, the hypervisor would give it a different whitening value, but at some point, hopefully, the encrypted Oracle data will match the data in memory, meaning it must have gotten the same one. So we don't actually have to know what the whitening value was or is. As long as we know it's the same, we can safely graft our new data over, effectively writing whatever we want to encrypted memory. <sighs> okay, so now that we have a way to overwrite encrypted memory, how can we extend this to take control of the hypervisor? Oh yeah, that update payload. During decompression, it uses a context struct that contains a lot of interesting things. Pointers to memory allocation functions, and a pointer to where the decompressed data should go. Stuff that could be quite exploitable. And all of this stuff is just in encrypted memory. No CRC checks to ensure it hasn't been tampered with. I mean, as we can see, overriding read-only encrypted memory was no easy task, but why didn't Microsoft enforce all of the protections it had here? Well, it seems like the payload contains a handful of data segments, and they're moved to either protected or encrypted memory depending on their size. Protected pages are 64 kilobytes in size, and while it would have been possible to stretch one segment of multiple protected pages, they would have had to program specifically for that, making the code significantly more complex. So it seems they decided to put anything larger than that in just encrypted memory instead. The decompression context is in the same segment as the scratch buffer, which is defined as two times the compressed data block size, which is 32 kilobytes. This comes out to 64 kilobytes plus a little extra because of the context. It just barely missed being able to fit in protected memory, and had it been, none of this exploit would have been possible. By far the most interesting thing in that decompression context is the pointers to custom malloc and free functions. If those could be hijacked, we'd get arbitrary code execution in hypervisor mode more or less for free. In practice though, the malloc function gets used too early. In the time it takes to check the whitening value and overwrite the memory if it matches, it's already been used the one time it does and it's too late to change it to something else. And sadly, and somewhat worryingly, the free function doesn't get called at all, so both of these ended up being non-starters. But another interesting pointer is the data output pointer. This is where the decompressed data gets written to, and if we overwrote that, we might be able to get the hypervisor to overwrite itself in a way that's useful to us. Unlike the malloc and free function pointers, this actually ended up being viable. The decompressor did end up overriding hypervisor code, but it was far from an ideal exploit. The payload has to be signed, so we have no control over what data it produces, and it writes a whole 32 kilobytes of it at a time. 
Unfortunately, all we're able to control with this is where that 32 kilobytes gets written. Grimdoomer's first thought was to look through the hypervisor's data segment for things that might be useful to overwrite, like pointers to other code or data. But this ultimately proved to be infeasible. The hypervisor's data segment was a minefield of data that would completely crash the system if overwritten, which is a problem when you're forced to write a whole 32 kilobytes at a time. Trying to overwrite anything even remotely interesting would end up overwriting something else that needed to be left alone. Despite this, Grimdoomer knew it was likely the closest thing he'd find to something that could overwrite hypervisor memory. So he accepted the challenge and decided he had to find a way to make it work. After thinking about it more, he realized that the decompressed data was bootloader code, meaning valid instructions for the 360's CPU. So maybe if he positioned the data in just the right place, he could replace a hypervisor system call with something a lot more useful. Helpfully, he found just the kind of thing he was looking for, an instruction in the decompressed bootloader code that would store a byte held in register R4 to an address held in register R6, followed immediately by a return instruction. If positioned just right, this could essentially become an arbitrary write function to any location in memory, including, crucially, code and data in the hypervisor segments. Okay, so here's how we make this work. First, use an exploitable game to get some arbitrary code execution. Grimdoomer used Tony Hawk, but any similar exploit will work. Then encrypt the address you want to force the payload to decompress to, somewhere that will cause the right instructions to end up replacing one of the hypervisor system calls. Then create two threads, one that just runs the payload over and over and over, and another that constantly checks it to see whether its whitening value was the same one we got when we encrypted our data. Once we have that, start hammering that new address into the struct. The payload will be updating the output buffer pointer at the same time, so we're effectively in a race to modify the address just at the right time to get our data into the right place. If we win the race condition, this will replace one of the hypervisor's system calls with an arbitrary write function, giving us the ability to directly modify the hypervisor. From here, it's fairly straightforward. We can modify another system call to jump to code that we've made ourselves, and just like that, we have arbitrary code execution in hypervisor mode. Full control of the system, purely from software. But as you can tell, there's nothing about this process that's easy. Relying on both a brute force of the whitening value and a race condition of the output buffer is like building a house on sand and on stilts. Not only could it take a long time for both of those to happen at all, but additionally, exploiting a race condition is inherently unsafe and could end up crashing the console completely. Grimdoomer was able to do some things to improve it. For example, reducing the effective size of the L2 cache helped to make it significantly more likely the CPU would pick up the replace pointer from memory, greatly improving the speed from 10 to 15 minutes down to as low as 2 to 3 minutes. But while he speculates it may be possible to further improve reliability and speed, he doesn't expect it to ever be an immediate hack. There's just too much volatility inherent in the process to ever reach a high level of reliability. Also, attacking the hypervisor without attacking the boot process produces an inherently temporary result. This may enable homebrew as long as the 360 stays on, but as soon as it powers off, it's back to stock configuration and you'll have to redo the entire process again. But still, Grimdoom approved once and for all that anyone who said the 360 was unhackable was wrong. It may not be a perfect hack, but it is a hack, and that's something. After Bad Update was released, the community rallied around to make the user experience somewhat more bearable. First order of business was replacing Tony Hawk American Wasteland, which had already started to hike up in price, with something a little freer like the XBLA trial of Rock Band Blitz. Fellow modders in Voxy Play Games and I Hate Comfer discovered a scripting engine bug in the game that could also be used to trigger bad update. Not only is the trial free, but Microsoft specifically allowed free XBLA demos to be installed from USB or even a burned DVD, which makes the exploit chain totally accessible to anyone. Second was to create a modded environment as close to LGH as possible. This came in the form of additional payloads such as Invoxy Play Games Free My Z and Byram 90's Z Unshackle. With these, a 360 exploited in this way functions largely the same as one modded with RGH, but again, only temporarily. And with the low reliability rates, you'll need a lot more patience than you'd need with a proper hard mod. But for those with a lot of patience and not a lot of soldering ability, there is now at least an option. This was a somewhat general overview of how the bad update exploit works, but if you're interested in even more technical information, I'll put a link in the description to Grimdoomer's blog, which has a series of in-depth articles that describe in more detail his process of figuring all of this stuff out and the various hurdles involved. Personally, I'm fascinated by stories of people conquering enormous puzzles like this. I hope you enjoyed the story too, and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye guys.